My name is Allison Wickens and I'm the Director of Education here at the National Postal Museum. And um, it's a, really a proud day for us to have both Donald Sunman and Janet Klug here um, as part, not only as part of the Sunman Lecture Series, but also as part of our 15th anniversary celebration here at the National Postal Museum. So now I'd like to introduce you um, to Na Cheryl Gans, who's giving directions to incoming people. She's the uh, Curator of Philately here at the National Postal Museum. Hi everybody, thank you for coming. Um, I hope you're going to take a moment to read the biography in here of Maynard Sudman. Uh, he was a, a really a legend in his own time. His son set up this uh, annual lecture series while he was still living and he just died last year. So this is a way we carry on the legacy of some really important people who worked so hard to promote our hobby and to make it grow because they loved it so much. How many in the audience collect stamps? I hope not one person put their, left their hand down because if you did, I'd call you a potential collector. And by the time you leave this room, I hope you've changed your mind. How many belong to a local stamp club? Okay, if you did not put your hand up, I expect before you go home today to talk to somebody around you and find out where is there a local club and go. This is the lifeblood of our hobby and it's where you'll have a lot of fun too. How many are members of APS, the National Society? All right, did you know your president's here? For some of you might not have met Nick. Nick, where are you? Here he is, your national president. Say hello to him afterwards. How many are members of this museum? Whoa, not as many hands. Okay, think about it. Your money to membership in our museum creates programs like this, helps us reach out to new collectors. Alan Kane is the director of our museum. He's back in the corner. Alan, you want to put your hand up in the air? And, and we do a lot of exciting things. So you're joining the museum helps support that. If you join today, you're eligible for a discount in the bookstore to buy this wonderful book and get it autographed. I'm so honored to introduce these two speakers. I can, I can call them both outstanding philatelists and friends at the same time. They're here to share their thoughts and ideas on this very creative book that they put out. Janet Klug is probably one of the most visible people in our hobby in America. She's the immediate past president of the American Philatelic Society, a judge, a columnist, an author, an exhibitor, if it can be done in our hobby, Janet has done it or is planning to create it. She has another book coming out later this year. She did in cooperation with our museum, A Guide to Stamp Collecting. It's going to be a great new book to bring new people into the hobby, so please watch for that. Don Sunman has brought more collectors into organized philately, I think, than any other individual in America and he's promoted collecting to new audiences in ways that no one else has done so creatively through Mystic Stamps. He chairs the Council of Philatelists here at our museum. It's a group of um, stamp collectors who help us do all kinds of special programs. So I would ask a couple things before uh, they come in. Please hold all questions until the end of their presentation. Then we'll have a question and answer session, and as uh, Allison said, we're going to have refreshments at a book signing out in the hallway. So please help me and give a warm welcome to Janet and Don. Oh, good afternoon. Thank you for coming. What a great uh, turnout. This is fantastic. And uh, I don't know where the slides are. I'm sorry. Oh, the remote's right there. Ah, okay. Where do I point it? Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Uh, this is the uh, sixth annual Maynard Sundman Lecture, as Cheryl was talking about. Uh, and I just, as uh, Cheryl also mentioned, my father passed away this uh, past October, uh, just after celebrating his 92nd birthday. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about him uh, before I start the, uh, the program and we talk about the stamps. I'm not doing it down. Okay, trying to go up. Uh -oh. Page down? I'm not. There we go. Okay, there's my father. 
My father started collecting stamps as a kid, about 12 years old, and a boyhood friend of his, Billy Potter, showed his stamp collection to my father at that time, who was not a collector, and my dad was just blown away. He was so excited. And my dad kept asking Billy, where'd you get them? Where'd you get these stamps? And Billy said, Frasic, which is a company no longer in business, and then Mystic, which is the company that I run that my father purchased in, in the 70s. So my father was very excited, went home to his father, who thought stamp collecting was a waste of time. And so my father said, I only want one stamp from each country. And his father thought that sounded reasonable. And then uh, uh, my father just never talked to his father about it for quite a while. So that's how he started his collection. He quickly wanted to be a stamp dealer, and at the time, H.E. Harris in Boston was the largest wholesale stamp company and became the largest retailer for many, many years. And so my father established a relationship with Harris. He started with a small amount of money that he'd made from uh, uh, trapping uh, rabbits or tra uh, yeah, trapping rabbits and also investing in the stock market. His father ended up borrowing money on his life insurance, lent it to my father, who uh, bought stamps from Harris. First he uh, dealt with Steve Harris, and then with H.E. Harris himself. Steve was H.E.'s brother. My father was, uh, entered uh, the service for World War II. He had to shut down his business. And when the war ended, he and my mother moved to Littleton, New Hampshire, and they started the Littleton Stamp Company. Um, Harris gave my father trade credit, which allowed him to expand and his business took off. And by the late 1960s, he employed about 100 people. In 74, he purchased Mystic Stamp Company in Camden, New York, near Syracuse. Uh, we had about 20, 25 employees. I moved to New York at the time, and uh, we've just grown since then. My father's uh, company, my brother David, uh, ended up taking over and is currently president of the company. My father stayed involved in the company right up to the very end, uh, going to work every day. He was very involved in advertising and marketing. He read Lynn's and he read all the catalogs we put out and Littleton puts out. And he was just, uh, his whole life was uh, uh, caught up in stamp and coin collecting. He just loved the hobby so much. The values of both of our companies are my father's values and my mother's values, and it's that customers come first. We have five core values. Colleagues, the people that work at our companies are two. Ethics, growth and profit, because we can't stay in business if we don't earn a profit. And to contribute to the stamp world and our local area. And so this lecture is one of the ways that we contribute to the stamp world. My father became the Walt Disney or Betty Crocker up at Littleton and that he would be at his royal typewriter. He never went to a computer, but he was even on the company tour. People would swing by and say hello to him. His impact on the twin hobbies uh, was very large. Today our two companies employ about 500 people serving uh, over a million stamp and coin collectors. We're major buyers of stamps and coins from dealers and collectors. And we support the hobby with this lecture. And there's a twin lecture, Maynard Sundman, uh, in that the American Numismatic Association runs about coins. After my father passed away, the New York Times reporter called me up and they were going to do a story on his life. And uh, I was impressed and surprised, honestly, and because uh, he was my dad. I didn't really realize uh, that the New York Times uh, would consider it worthy of their publication. But the reporter said that his editor considered my father one of the pioneers of modern advertising. And I said, you know, you're right, that he started when advertising was so small and, and uh, through direct response, he really did a lot to uh, uh, promote the hobby and also uh, advertising breakthroughs. Mike Lawrence, who was the editor-publisher of Lynn Stamp News for many years, wrote me a nice note after uh, my father passed away. And um, part of the note, he said, is, two men made a large impact on the stamp hobby in the 20th century, H.E. Harris and Maynard Sundman. And so uh, that's why we're here. So thank you. Oh. <laughs> I'll talk a little bit about, briefly, tell you how the selection process for the 100 Greatest Stamps uh, worked. There's their uh, book title. Uh, Janet and I spoke with collectors and uh, people that, uh, dealers, stamp dealers, and we developed a list based on popularity of stamps, the beauty, rarity, great stories, designs, and topics. And we took all those suggestions and we gave it to Whitman, the publisher, and they put it in a ballot 
They sent it to American uh, Philatelic Society members and asked the members, uh, a selected group of the members, to rank, to vote for 100 of the 150 or 200 stamps into rank order, uh, what's number one, number two, number three. Whitman then um, organized all that data and gave it to us, and that became uh, how the list was selected. So it isn't Janet's and my list, it's, uh, it's your list, it's the APS uh, members list. People voted online. The write-ins, the stamps that uh, did not make the initial list, are in the honorable mentions. Janet? Thank you, Which button? Okay, I can do that. All right, so let's talk for a moment about what makes a stamp great. All of us who are stamp collectors know what we like. We have our own particular favorite stamps. Is that right? Do I see some? Yes. I have some, some stamps that I love, too, and that I'll be talking to you uh, about very soon. But um, as Don has said, there are several reasons that make stamps great. They can be historically important. They can be philatelically important. They can be stamp firsts. Or they can be stamps of great beauty or have a great story. So let's look at some of the stamps that fit into these categories. Stamps can be historically important. If significant history was the, pro the overriding cause for greatness, this would be the greatest stamp in the world. Look at it. It's a, it this is actually a proof, I believe. But it's a revenue stamp that finished in 60th place. Now, why, would it top the why should it top the chart at number one? What well, was issued in 1766, Great Britain imposed a revenue stamp on the American colonies at that time. And this stamp planted the seeds that grew into a re revolution that changed the world. You've heard the phrase, no taxation without representation. Um, this, was, this was the stamp I voted for number one, and you see where I fell into the... <laughs> um, all right. Uh, whoops. The first U.S. stamps are historically important. The 1847 five cent Washington and the 10 cent <coughs> Franklin came in at number one and two, which is, happens to be their Scott catalog value, Scott catalog num number. These stamps also fit into other categories that are a measure of greatness, philatelic significance, and firsts. Many stamps fit m into more than one category. They also have great stories, so it's understandable that stamp collectors would have picked these two stamps for the top positions. Other stamps that are examples of historic importance include the 1861 $2 Wells Fargo stamp that came in at number 16 and the 10 cent moon landing stamp at number 39. Whoops. All right, philatelic importance. Philatelic importance can be looked at in a number of different ways. But for the sake of, sake of brevity, let's consider stamps that have uh, promoted and enhanced stamp collecting. Everyone, not even non-stamp collectors, know this stamp. It's arguably the most recognized U.S. stamp. It landed upside down, I suppose, in third place. In 1993, a 29-cent uh, Elvis stamp came out, which the U.S. Postal Service tells us is its most popular stamp ever with the general public. Uh, this probably would have ended up in first place had the general pu public alone. <laughs> <laughs> However, it finished with stamp collectors as number 81, and I think that's not bad because stamp collectors were very mixed about whether this, sh this stamp should have ever been uh, issued but it brought unprecedented uh, publicity to stamps and stamp collecting. Every television station and newspaper in the country had coverage on the first day of issue of the Elvis stamp. The 1926 White Plains Souvenir Sheet, number 56 in the 100 Greatest, was the first of its kind uh, for what was then the U.S. Post Office Department and it initiated post office support for international stamp shows held in the United States ever since then. Thank you, U.S. Postal Service. Is Cindy still here? Cindy here? No? 
Okay. Um, stamp firsts can make a, a great stamp, and there are many firsts within the 100 greatest stamps. The first commemorative stamps uh, in the United States were the 1893 Columbians, and this is the highest denomination of that set, $5. It ranks at number four in the 100 greatest. The first bicolor stamps, oh, isn't that lovely? <laughs> Uh, with the 90 cent, for, for the 1869s, there were three values or four values in the 1869s that uh, were bicolors. And this is the highest uh, denomination of that, the 90 cent Lincoln, which ranks at number five in the 100 greatest. Another first was the first American woman on a U.S. stamp was the eight, eight cent Martha Washington issued in 1902 series. Now, I, I know some stamp collectors are going, oh, no. <laughs> um, the first U.S. self-adhesive stamps, and, and they're all self-adhesives now, or just about all, um, is one that was engineered to self-destruct. Uh, as you can see, it's very modeled in appearance, and that's probably a good one. Um, this first, it was the first self-adhesive, uh, ranks at number 99 out of 100. Now, another Christmas stamp, the lovely 1964 Christmas stamps, were the first, say, tenant stamps. That is, different stamp designs connected together. Uh, this set of four ranks at 94. Great beauty. Many stamp collectors feel that this stamp, the 1898 $1 Western Cattle in a Storm, is the loveliest stamp that was ever issued. Um, there are lovely stamps, but that one is spectacular. Uh, and that's another one that's very popular with stamp collectors for, for its sheer, utter beauty. The 1871 documentary, documentary revenue stamps known lovingly, I must admit, by stamp collectors as Persian rugs because they are very large and very ornate. Uh, but they are breathtakingly beautiful. Uh, ranks, they rank at number, uh, these stamps that I just talked about rank at number six and number 22 respectively. Um, this, these gorgeous stamps had stiff competition, though. For example, the 1865 five-cent newspaper stamp that ranks at number 98 and the 1922 $5 America ranking at number 9 um, are actually, this stamp is actually mislabeled, and I think Don's going to talk about that a little bit more, uh, but it shows the Statue of Freedom and it says America underneath there. Um, and this is one of my favorite stamps. The 14 cent American Indian, I think that's a lovely stamp. All of those stamps could win beauty contests. Great rarity. Um, rarity is an important factor to stamp collectors uh, because, you know, that's one of the things that helps determine greatness. This is the infamous one cent Z grill, and it ranks at number 15. Uh, the man st the man next to me over here traded this stamp for a plate block of inverted jennies. Did he get a good deal, do you think? <laughs> I think he did, too. Uh, the 1869 inverts are also great rarities, uh, ranking at number 17, and the 1852 13-cent Hawaiian missionary stamp ranking at 52, and uh, the Alexandria Blue Boy ranks at number 61. They're all recognized as great, as great world-class uh, rarities. And finally, there are stamps with great stories, such as the, eight, the 1986 one dollar rush stamp <coughs> invert that has become known as the CIA invert because of where, it's, er, where it was originally discovered. That ranks at number 66. The 1962 Dov Hammerskold uh, ranks at number 90, which was a rare stamp for just a couple of weeks. It's an invert, <laughs> and in its wonderful wisdom, the U.S. Post Office Department reissued them purposely with the yellow inverted that made a couple of guys really angry who thought that they had been uh, made wealthy by their discovery. And now we all have them, multiple copies of them in our stamp albums, right? Uh, stamps issued by the Confederate States of America uh, mark a rebellion. 
the bloodiest war in American history. This uh, five cent value, 1861 uh, Confederate States of America Jefferson Davis stamp ranks at number 54, and it tells this sad tale of death and destruction. So let's, let's start looking at some of our uh, favorite greatest American stamps, Don. Oh, I'm going the wrong way here. This is my favorite. It's number three on the list. <laughs> <laughs> I used to have a different favorite, but it's changed. It, uh, <laughs> I'm fickle. Janet uh, uh, mentioned this, and of course it is the most famous stamp, I think, in the world. Um, I actually thought it would be voted number one, and so I was surprised that it was number three. But it has, I think, everything. It has rarity. It's beautiful. It has a great story. It has eye-popping prices. The uh, discovery sheet uh, in uh, 1918 uh, was sold to Colonel Green, and that's just part of the start of the, such an amazing story. And Colonel Green was a very wealthy man. His mother, Hetty Green, was uh, called the Witch of Wall Street, and she took their family fortune that was made in the whale, whale oil business before we had Standard Oil, and she uh, went to Wall Street and multiplied it many times. Uh, Colonel Green uh, ended up with this unbelievable amount of money and he spent some of it on building world-class stamp and coin collections and he was just an amazing collector but he was eccentric too uh, and all that weirdness uh, made these stamps uh, so famous at the time people couldn't believe that uh, an individual would pay twenty thousand dollars for a sheet of stamps in 1918 which is just a phenomenal amount of money so, oh, going there. I'll get this. Here's a photo of Colonel Green, and that's one of the first car radios, if you can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> he wanted to have the first of everything because he was the Bill Gates of his time in terms of wealth, and uh, he had one of the first automobiles, and then he put that car radio. He had that put on his uh, car for him, and he, you can see he's listening to the headphones. The... Um, uh, Colonel Green also put a stamp on a locket and gave it to a friend that disappeared for many years. It showed up a few years ago at a Siegel auction. Uh, the Miller copy, uh, the Miller uh, exhibit is here at the Poster Museum. Uh, that stamp was stolen from the New York Public Library. The perfs are trimmed, uh, and then it was recovered years later. Uh, there's a block stolen at an APS show called the McCoy block, and they're slowly getting those stamps back one by one. Uh, and then just recently, a stamp sold for almost a million dollars, $977,000, which was a record price for a U.S. stamp. Another part of the, uh, the, the story is, uh, is it's the history of airmail, that they uh, rushed the stamp into production, and just as uh, they were starting uh, the airmail process, and there's... Um, Books, a book called The Jenny, and it tells the story. The first flight was a comedy of errors with the pilot heading out uh, up towards New York and going south and circling around, and it really wasn't that, uh, uh, wasn't that effective. But uh, as Janet mentioned, uh, we traded the one cent zero for the plate block of the uh, Jenny Invert in 2005, and that was uh, an exciting thing that it was covered in the New York Times and uh, received a lot of publicity for our uh, hobby. Care to dance? Yeah. <laughs> All right, now you see Don's favorite stamp. There's mine. Now I know what the collectors here are, are saying. Well, that's not much of a favorite stamp. But I was uh, pleased and a little bit surprised that my favorite U.S. stamp, this 1869 three cent locomotive, not only made the cut of the 100 greatest, but landed in 18th place. Uh, very surprised about that. Um, this stamp is seldom found nicely centered. It's not rare or difficult to acquire. It's not expensive. Um, even being sh just shy of 140 years old, it can easily be found mint, used, on cover, and if you're not fussy about condition, you can buy it for, you know, uh, just a couple of bucks, a pittance. So why is this stamp my favorite stamp? Probably because of all of those reasons. 
It's not rare. It's not expensive. And so it was the very first single stamp that I, that I bought for my collection that didn't come in a packet. I purchased it as a youth for about 40 cents, which is about what my copy is still worth today. <laughs> now I'll tell you why I bought that. Why would a little girl in Ohio buy that locomotive stamp? Well, I became somewhat despondent. Um, if my mother was still alive, she would say that I was kind of a brat at the time. Um, because the first page in my stamp album was an H.E. Harris Traveler stamp album. Didn't have any stamps on it. All of the other pages had at least one stamp on it, but that first page was an U.S. Uh, 19th century, and there were no stamps on that page, even though there were spaces for stamps. So my mother took me downtown. There was a, a, a department store that had a stamp counter. Um, some of you will remember department stores that had stamp counters, and I see a lot of heads going, yes, yes, yes. Um, so uh, I spent about maybe two hours looking in the uh, counters, uh, trying to find a stamp that would go on the first page, and that's the one that I saw that I could afford and that I liked. It, it fulfilled all of my requirements. Number one, I could afford it. Number two, it was pretty. And number three, it didn't have an old dead guy on it. <laughs> so guess what? It was love at first sight. I took it home, hinged it on the first page of my album, and I have loved this stamp ever since. So it, my copy is typically poorly centered. It has a somewhat unattractive cancel. And uh, it has certainly not appreciated much in value, but I still love it very much. Am I? Yeah, well, I'm out of sequence on, uh, with my notes, I'm sorry to say. Um, this was my number f uh, one favorite stamp for many years, that, uh, the one cent Z Grill. Uh, it's, uh, I think what's exciting about it is the rarity and the price. There's only two known. Uh, it's thought that perhaps a thousand were printed. A man named Stevenson was an expert in grills, which are like the embossing on stamps uh, that the post office was experimenting with to allow the ink to soak into the stamp to prevent reuse of the stamp. Probably wasn't needed on a one cent stamp. Uh, it was more apt to be uh, reused and the ink removed on the high value stamps. But anyway, Stevenson was a stamp expert, and uh, prior to him, collectors considered grills all the same stamp. But Stevenson studied it, and he said, no, there's actually several different grills that were used as the uh, post office was changing the size of the grill to get a better product. And so Stevenson categorized the grills in families, A, B, C, D, in what he thought was the order that they were issued. And this was a mystery to him, so he called it the Z grill. And, uh, and put it at the end. Uh, and later, uh, the students believe that it's, uh, it's an early grill, about the same time as the A grill. Stevenson found the only two examples that are known. He sold one to a dealer who sold it to Miller, and so it was here on display at the Postal Museum last year uh, as part of Miller I. Uh, Stevenson kept this copy in, uh, in his own collection. He died in the 50s in Chicago, and that's when the stamp came on the market. And then it went through a series of collectors, but it was almost an unknown stamp in the 50s and 60s uh, because it, there was only one, and, and it rapidly appreciated in price. In the late 70s, it sold for about $100,000, and then it sold for $418,000 to uh, Robert Zollner, uh, who put together a fabulous collection of stamps. And then when the Zollner collection was sold, uh, I thought it would be a great stamp for our company, Tone Mystic Stamp Company, because I looked at it as the Michael Jordan of stamps. I thought it would be an endorsement uh, for our company. And so I'll see if I have the slide. Here it is. Uh, I went, uh, this is uh, 10 years ago, and I was with my son, who was, uh, uh, gosh, 10 years old at the time. We went to New York, and we bid on the stamp, and he was so excited about the bidding that we were there to buy this stamp and perhaps one other. And uh, he kept seeing, we were following along in the catalog, and there were, the Zollner collection had fabulous stamps, wonderfully centered. 
that may have had a modest catalog value but sold for huge premiums. And Zach would look at the catalog and he'd say, Dad, this is $5. I think I can afford that. He was so anxious to get his paddle up. And <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, we had to keep our powder dry for the, uh, the stamp we really wanted. So we bought this and then um, uh, Scott Treppel, the auctioneer, uh, stopped the auction and uh, we had a photo taken, which was fun. Uh, so my son's now 20 and he occasionally uh, goes to stamp shows and works our booth if we take a booth. Um, we traded the, let's see, yeah, here we go. And then this is the trade, uh, Charles Shreve uh, representing Bill Gross uh, traded the Jenny Plate Block for the one cent Z-Grill that Mr. Gross wanted for his collection in front of the Washington show. And so that was, uh, again, a fun uh, moment and I think a great story for our hobby and it was covered in the New York Times and elsewhere. Um, many collectors think they have a one cent Z-Grill, that we probably get uh, a few hundred people a year that call us up and say, I've got one, I've got another. And so we used to uh, tell people, well, it's unlikely, uh, but now we just say, isn't that exciting? Send it in and get a certificate from the Philatelic Foundation and then we'd love to buy it. And so, uh, of course, it's just a rare stamp and, and unfortunately people don't have that stamp, they have 63. <laughs> I know Don's son, Zach, and he is a fine young man. He's, he works uh, the stamp booth at stamp shows sometimes, and uh, he's, he's always so courteous and sweet, but he's still very miffed at Dad for, selling his, for trading his stamp away. All right, another favorite stamp of mine is this Pony Express stamp. Is there any mail delivery system in the world? Uh, more famous than the Pony Express. You just hear those two words, Pony Express, and you are immediately transported back to the days of the Wild West, cowboys and Indians, stagecoaches, um, all of those wonderful things from, from our American West. With all those romantic notions going around in our head, isn't it surprising to uh, remember that the, the horseback relay mail delivery method was a private enterprise, not a postal service enterprise. It was operated by the Central Overland California and Pikes Peak Express Company for whom Wells Fargo became agents. The fame surrounding the P Pony Express also overshadows the fact that this service only operated for 18 months, from April 1860 to October 1861. The Pony Riders successfully carried mail along a 2,000 mile route from St. Joseph, Missouri to Sacramento, California in about 10 days, whittling the transportation time of sending a mail, the mail across the continent uh, from eight weeks to 10 days. But sadly, the Pony Express operated at a financial loss to its investors. Even without the burgeoning death, debt, the Pony Express days were numbered because construction of the transcontinental telegraph was completed on October 24th 1861, and technology made sending messages cheaper and faster, not unlike email is doing today, a century later. The $2 Pony Express stamp ranks at number 16 in the 100 greatest. It was released in April 1861, when the rate for a half-ounce letter had been reduced from the initial $5, which if you can, can put that into today, today's money, that would be $125 to mail a half-ounce letter to two dollars, which is still a hefty uh, fifty dollars in today's money. Don? Number six on the list of the hundred greatest American stamps is the one dollar Trans-Mississippi stamp. And that's just, uh, most collectors, many collectors consider this one of the most beautiful. It's just so richly engraved and it's a, a quintessential Western scene. Um, and it's just a wonderful series. This came out in 1898. Uh, of course, 1893 was the, when the Colombians were issued and the post office uh, uh, issued the Colombians in $1, $2, $3, $4, and $5 stamps, which were beautiful stamps and we love them today. But at the time, collectors realized they were being gouged and uh, the stamps ended up uh, for quite a while selling as discount postage below face value. So several years later, I think the post office reacted and they issued uh, a $1 and a $2 stamp as the high value. So they didn't go all the way up to $5, but it's still an awful lot of money uh, back uh, in 1898. 
this stamp was to be a bicolor stamp, and this is uh, similar to w the way it would have been uh, printed in 1898. Uh, Janet mentioned the prior bicolors in 1869, and so uh, this many years later, the um, uh, Bureau of Engraving and Printing thought that they could actually uh, print bicolors, but then something happened. The Spanish-American War, uh, remember the Maine, the ship uh, that exploded in Havana Harbor in Cuba, uh, happened, and at that time, the, when uh, income taxes didn't exist, and so when we went to war, the government put all kinds of taxes on all the transactions, bank checks and and uh, legal transactions, and so the Bureau of Engraving and Printing instead had to print all these tax stamps, some of which show a battleship in 1898, and so that's why the stamp was only printed in one color. They didn't have the press time uh, to do the second press and print the whole series in two colors. Um, the other part of the story that I like, because I look at this and you think of the Old West, is that the painting is actually based uh, uh, on cattle in Scotland in a snowstorm. And so, yeah, <laughs> it's just amazing, I think, when you hear that. Janet. Well, we're going to talk about Elvis again. On January 8, 1993, the U.S. Postal Service released its best-selling stamp of all time, 29-cent Elvis Presley, which ranks at 81 in the 100 greatest. Elvis was known as the king of rock and roll. He would have been 58 years old on that day. His millions of fans stood in lines in post offices all around the country to buy this stamp, bearing his image. Stamp up. Uh, post offices ran out of stamps during the day's time. And it really made the most out of it. Uh, the U.S. Postal Service a year earlier uh, polled postal patrons uh, and music lovers to, and asked them to vote on which Elvis they would like to see on the stamp. The young, hip, gyrating Elvis that was on the, uh, that they would only shoot on television from the waist up because he was considered to be um, very, very uh, controversial and, and too sexy for television. Um, gee, how times have changed now, right? <laughs> or the Vegas Elvis in a spangled jumpsuit. That brilliant marketing ploy that generated all of that interest a whole year before these stamps were ever issued is in this room right now. Alan Kane? Alan, where are you? He stepped out. <laughs> He's now the director of this museum. On the day of issue, postal workers all over the country dressed in 1950s style. The post offices played Elvis tunes all day long. Um, my post office, I live in a little town in Ohio, my post office had return to sender on in a, a loop all day long. <laughs> Would you like me to sing a little bit? <laughs> um, every television station and newspaper in the country carried uh, news about the stamps that had people standing in these long lines. Um, this kind of favorable press coverage, we, we, could, we in this hobby could never have afforded that. That was a huge, wonderful marketing ploy by the U.S. Postal Service, the brainchild of Alan Kane, who just stepped back in. Alan? <laughs> Number nine on the list is the um, 1922 to 25 five dollar Americana stamp, or America stamp. And again, this is uh, it's an expensive stamp, uh, mint condition, it's several hundred dollars, but in used condition, it's just maybe twenty dollars in sound condition, and uh, perfins and so forth are about ten dollars. I think it's just such a beautiful stamp, uh, red, white, and blue, fabulous engraving. Um, it's a high value. In 1922, $5 was a lot of money. And so a lot of these stamps, many of these stamps, were used uh, by banks that they would ship currency or coins by registered mail. And uh, that, um, because average individuals didn't have a lot of use for such an expensive stamp. So as a dealer, I would see a lot of perfins and blocks of four where it, uh, the stamp was put on a tag that was attached to the money bag and it would be sent from a, one bank to another, the Federal Reserve Bank to a bank. Um, 
it says America, and in the book we tell the story about how the stamp was to be issued, and the, the engraving already existed, and it had been mislabeled America. It's actually the statue that's at the uh, top of the Capitol building, which, uh, Roger, what's that called? Okay. And it was just refurbished, too, a few years ago. It's an amazing statue, 15 feet high. Um, but the engraver took the title off of the file, which was in error, it put it on the stamp, and then uh, Roger and I were talking last night, and uh, Roger brought it to the attention of the Postal Service when they reprinted the stamp for 2006 that they could change it and fix it, but it was too late. The stamp was already in production. <laughs> so it, it's funny how um, those errors just continue to perpetuate themselves. Janet. Well, I picked the 1893 $2 Columbian to represent all of the Columbians so that I could tell you about how these, this book was actually uh, being written. The essays that in the 100 greatest, each, each stamp has an essay going along with it. And so Don and I divvied up the writing of the book so that we would each have 50 to write. Um, essentially, when we found out from Whitman, the publishers, which stamps made the cut, we started picking out the stamps that we were going to write about. Of course, you pick out your favorites first, and then you pick out some more. And honestly, there were no disagreements, but there were sometimes stamps left over that didn't get picked by either one of us, sort of like that geeky kid in, in high school who doesn't get picked to be on the basketball team. Um, so that took some negotiation. So anyway, I picked the Columbians, and Don took the Transmiss. I took the 1869s, Don took the Pan Ams. Well, the first essay I wrote for, the, for this book was the Columbians, and I wrote them in rank order, however they landed in the voting. I did the first one, and then the second one, and then the third one. So that meant that I wrote about the $5 Columbian first, because it ranks at number four. And then the $1 Columbian, which ranked at 24, and so on. Um, there are, were 16 stamps in this series, and six of them made the 100 greatest. The $2 was the lowest ranking, uh, lowest ranking one in, in, in the ranking of the 100 greatest. So it was the last one that I wrote about. So by the time I got to the $2 value, um, I was going kind of loopy <laughs> writing about Christopher Columbus, uh, trying to figure out what was true and what was false. Um, here is a man that we celebrate in this country as being the discoverer of the new world. He is a heroic figure to all of us in America, but he never set foot on the, on the continental United States. As shown on the $2 denomination of, of the Colombians, he ended up being returned in chains to Spain after having been, been accused of a lot of things, among which were, was tyranny. So after writing about all of these Colombians, I could hardly wait to begin writing about the 1869s, which I loved dearly anyway. But I decided I was not going to go in rank order anymore because it was just uh, too, um, you know, too strict for me to follow that. I was just going to draw one out of the hat and start writing about it. As luck would have it, the one I pulled out of the hat to write about first uh, ranks at number 47. It's the 15 cent denomination of 1869's, the landing of Columbus. <laughs> this is uh, number 22 on our list, and uh, Janet had already given you an, a bit of an overview on this. This is $500, just such an amazing amount of money. Uh, again, the, the Civil War occurred, no income taxes, the North had to pay for the war, so they taxed the heck out of all the transactions, and $500, I think, was mostly used on railroad bonds and very large transactions. The, uh, there's 75 or 80 of these stamps that are known. It was printed on a little sheet of one one by itself. And the interesting thing, I, I believe it's unique uh, with, with this series, is that the plate that printed this stamp is in three parts. 
and so the black is one plate and the orange is another and the green a third and they interlocked and so they would ink each section by itself they'd put it together so it would interlock and then they would make the impression and print the stamp and part of that is they wanted a very detailed design because they didn't want the stamp reused or be counterfeited. Five hundred dollars was a phenomenal amount of money and that was real money to the government. And it's just made such a, a rare stamp that is gorgeous. Most of us in this room today will remember this event, the first man on the moon. On May 25th, 1961, President John F. Kennedy challenged Congress and the American people with these words. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth. Now, put those words in the context of the time. The Soviet Union had launched Yuri Gagarin, the first man in space, just six weeks earlier. The United States' own Project Mercury had barely gotten off the ground with just one successful manned suborbital flight under its belt. And here was the President of the United States steering America on a course that would have a man on the moon within eight years, boldly going where no man had gone before. Now, how cool was that? Okay, so fast forward eight years to July 20th, 1969 when U.S. astronauts Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landed on the moon in a vehicle that looked like it was made from a child's erector set and aluminum foil, from which Armstrong made that fateful giant leap for mankind. Along with Aldrin and Armstrong and their little lunar, land lunar landing module, I knew I was going to screw that up, was a piece of engraved steel that bore the image of a man exiting the lunar vehicle and putting that first human footprint on the, on the moon. That piece of steel was a die for making a plate of postage stamps. When the astronauts returned safely to, to Earth, the stamps went into production, and on September 3, 1969, the ten-cent first man on the moon stamps were issued, allowing collectors and non-collectors alike to have, own, and use a little piece of lunar history. Don? Here's a few stamps that did not make the cut. The $100 marijuana stamp, which uh, came from here really, uh, hit the marketplace. Uh, the Internal Revenue Service in the 50s, I believe, I'm not sure exactly, but gave uh, millions of stamps to the National Postal Collection, which was part of American history at the time, and then they were auctioned a few years ago to raise money for the museum collection. And this is just, uh, I think, a, a really interesting stamp. The, um, as I understand it, marijuana wasn't outlawed in the 30s, but it was a controlled substance, and so researchers could, uh, could uh, uh, get a permission from the government to buy it and use it for research purposes. And so there's low values that the, is what the researchers paid for their, um, uh, when they wanted to buy the marijuana to do whatever. I don't know what a researcher would do with it, but uh, then <laughs> the rules were written so that if you were not a researcher, you could have your marijuana, uh, but you had to pay $100 uh, tax to the government in the 1930s. Just imagine, $100. And then you also had to register with the government so they knew who you were. Uh, and uh, these stamps are, are very rare, and uh, there's uh, 500 that were sold by the museum uh, a few years ago, and so it's just a great stamp for collectors. And we're really fortunate the museum would keep these stamps for all these years and then uh, allow us the opportunity to buy them. Another s set of stamps that didn't make the cut are the overrun nation stamps. On September 1st, 1939, Nazi Germany invaded P Poland, uh, setting off a se series of events that led to what we now call World War II. Eighteen months after the United States entered the war, June 1943, the U.S. Post Office Department uh, initiated a series of gorgeous stamps and tributes to those nations that had been overtaken by the enemy. First came Poland, then Czechoslovakia, 
followed by Norway, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Belgium, France, Greece, Yugoslavia, Albania, Austria, Denmark, and Korea. The five cent stamps covered the rate of sending a single letter by surface rate uh, to overseas, and that showed the United States to be allies in the struggle against fascism. The stamps were a philatelic first for the USA. In the middle of the war, rationing of almost, there was rationing of almost everything. The American banknote company went the extra mile and printed these stamps using three or four colors, a technique that had not been used previously for the United States postage stamps. They were then, and still are, stunning to look at and fascinating to collect. Don? Oops. Stamps that didn't make the cut. 1909, 13 cent George Washington. I just really like this stamp. I think it's a pretty color. It's more pretty in person. And when I first was involved in stamps, uh, I was so confused with watermarking and perfing, and, and I just love these uh, stamps where there can only be one stamp. You didn't have to <laughs> watermark it or perf it, and so, <laughs> and so I very much wanted it to be uh, in the hundred greatest. I see nods of recognition here. Uh, we love stamp, we stamp collectors love mistakes. The U.S. Postal Service does not. So in 1994 when a pane of Legends of the West stamp was found to have a picture of the wrong guy for the legendary cowboy African-American Bill Pickett, the Postal Service was pretty embarrassed. Worse, some of the stamps had inadvertently been released before the official issue date which meant that some of the wrong Bill Pickett stamps were in public hands. Oops! The U.S. Postal Service recalled the sheets that were uh, in post offices all around the country and reprinted the sheets with the correct Bill Pickett, but then they had a whole bunch of error sheets and a whole bunch of irate stamp collectors that didn't get the error sheets. What to do, what to do. The Postal Service established a lottery for 150,000 sheets of the error legends of the West stamps. Collectors could send a check for $5.80 to the U.S. Postal Service, which then randomly selected 150,000 winners who received one sheet or more than one if they sent in multiple requests and were really, really lucky. The process still left some co collectors disgruntled. Big surprise there, right? Uh, but it was easier, uh, it was an easier contest to win than most, and there was definitely a cash payoff for the $5.80. Today, these, the error sheets command about $150 on the open market. Now, you may want to know what my success rate was. Well, I sent in one for me and one for my husband because you were supposed to limit yourself to just one. So we each sent in for one, and we each were successful. Um, I came across one of these disgruntled collectors, and he was going to give up collecting U.S. stamps because he didn't get a bill picket. So rather than lose uh, a, a really good collector and a good friend of mine, I gave him mine. And about, oh, six months later, when the, when the price for these had gone up to around $190, I came across another disgruntled stamp collector, and the other one went flying out the window. And so I spent uh, $10, no, $11.60 uh, keeping two stamp collectors in the hobby. <laughs> <laughs> Stamps that didn't make the cut. The, uh, this is the offset, uh, 1918, one cent George Washington. During uh, World War I, uh, when World War I broke out, uh, the printing inks that we used to print our stamps, the chemicals that made up the inks came from Germany, the high quality chemicals. There was an embargo after the U.S. entered the war, and so we didn't trade with Germany. And so we had to use inferior chemicals uh, that uh, wore out the printing plates way too quickly. So the post office ended up switching from steel engraved plates 
you can see the stamp on the left is steel engraved, to a cheaper process, uh, offset printing, which is the way newspapers are printed, or used to be anyways. And so the stamp is a smooth surface. It doesn't look as nice, but it is cheaper uh, for the post office to print. And I just think it's a fascinating story how war affects stamps and stamp collecting, and we as hobbyists end up preserving that little bit of history. Well, there are some stamps that didn't make the cut of the 100 greatest and stamps that didn't even make the honorable mention. And so I'd like to talk to you about a few of those stamps that didn't make the honorable mention and should have. Um, as I state in the introduction to the book, the problem with selecting only 100 stamps as being the greatest means that a whole lot of stamps are going to be overlooked. For example, I was really disappointed that there was no representation of the U.S. Postal Service's longest uh, running stamp series, the Black History Series. For each year since uh, 1978, the Postal Service has introduced us to such notable Americans as Harriet Tubman, a courageous woman who helped over 300 slaves escape to, to freedom, Nobel Prize winner Martin Luther King, who led the Civil Rights Movement in the 1960s, ragtime composer and mu musician Scott Joplin, and my personal favorite, a lov the lovely young Bessie Coleman. Bessie uh, had a dream to fly. She couldn't find a flying school in the southern state of Texas that would accept a black female student, so she kept looking. She went to Chicago and earned money working as a manicurist, and then went to France, who would accept a black woman uh, for flying lessons. She returned to the United States in September 1921, the first black woman to have ever earned a pilot's license from the International Aviation Federation. She barnstormed, she appeared in a movie, she lectured, she earned enough money to buy her own plane. Bessie's young life ended in an unfortunate flying accident in a plane piloted by someone other than herself. Uh, she was a determined young woman uh, who achieved her goals even over the odds. The Black History series is 30 years old this month and it contains some of the greatest stories in American history. I hope the series will continue for a long time uh, as the U.S. Postal Service issues stamps and uh, introduces us to other extraordinary American uh, citizens. Well, many of us sitting in this room will recall the international stamp show Ameripex held in Chicago in 1986. The U.S. Postal Service released a booklet of stamps promoting stamp collecting well in advance of the show. The booklet had a stamp that was a joint issue with Sweden. Some of the stamps showed the tools of stamp collecting and even a membership card from the American Philatelic Society. Uh, that stamp, that particular stamp was uh, in there to honor the APS's 100th birthday that took place that year. I believe the APS is now uh, 122 years old. Uh, the cover of the booklet was actually a free admission ticket into Ameripex and this booklet helped pr promote the show to thousands of people and increase the admission by oh, probably tenfold. It was the very best stamp show, uh, stamp show promotion ever done by the U.S. Postal Service, in my opinion. This wonderful National Postal Museum became a reality in 1993. The U.S. Postal Service issued a block of four stamps to mark the opening of this museum. The set shows some of the larger-than-life Americans that you will see when you visit the museum and some of the great stamp rarities that you will see while you are here. The stamps uh, that were issued in, 1980, in 1993 are a wonderful tribute to the museum, to the museum staff, and to the museum director, Alan Kane. Do you have these They're not on a slide. I'm sorry. They're not on a slide. We have no way of knowing how many thousands of new collectors this museum brings to us every year. But each of us here owes the National Postal Museum a debt of gratitude for promoting the hobby and giving uh, stamp collecting the unprecedented level of respect and significance. Happy 15th birthday, National Postal Museum, and a big thank you to the staff who makes the magic happen. Don. We're going to mention a few of the things, the lessons we learned from uh, writing the book. 
And I think one of the first things uh, is the most important lesson is that to ask people for help. That everybody that we asked uh, was very eager to help, and uh, it's we waited a little too long on some things to, to ask. But it just uh, people in this hobby are just fantastic and want to share. And so we received a lot of images from uh, auction firms and individuals uh, if we didn't have uh, the right image that we were looking for, both the collateral images and even some of the stamps. I'd say start as early as you can because many things go wrong, things that we don't plan for. Uh, for example, the scanning of the stamps and the images, we had to do it three times, which took a lot of time. At first, uh, the publisher, uh, there was a communication issue and we were given the wrong specifications on what they needed. Then we were given the right specifications, but we didn't understand it, so we scanned them again all the wrong way. And then the third time, uh, after the publisher said, well, this won't do, uh, we got it right. And so we understood the specifications and, and we scanned it, uh, but it was a lot of wasted effort. Another issue is that it's kind of technical, but we, at our company, uh, we put together the text and we use a program called Quark, which is common in publishing. And the publisher uses, they wanted all the text in Word. And so as the changes went back and forth, yeah, we were surprised in Word uh, that that uh, caused some formatting issues and, and again, a little bit of wasted issue. Uh, and, and time was always an issue. We went right to the deadline and then had to push the deadline back a bit. So uh, better planning would have helped. And Janet, you learned some things too, I think. I did indeed. <laughs> I'll stay beside you if that's Great. okay. Great, sure. Uh, I will be brief. Um, I learned two very important lessons from doing this book. Um, the first was that it was a reminder to me uh, as a collector who sold my U.S. collection about 15 years ago that all the U.S. stamps have great stories to tell, even the weird ones. And uh, we have to keep our minds open to what our stamps are telling us because there's great history, uh, great fun to be had in those. The second lesson I learned is a very important one for all you aspiring writers. And I am speaking from experience now. Uh, so here it goes. Never, ever try to write two books at the same time. <laughs> Um, as, as Cheryl said earlier, I have another book coming out in, next month or in April, I'm not sure which, um, entitled The Smithsonian Guide to Stamp Collecting. And uh, I was writing for both of these books at the same time. They were both due on April 15, 2007, along with my taxes. And so for the six months prior to that date, I became a philatelic zombie hermit mm -hmm. whose fingers were just attached permanently to the keyboard. And I thank my husband, my understanding husband, Russ, who stood with me through that whole time period because it was not fun. <laughs> <laughs> and I would add uh, one more thought that I've had, that if you're going to write a book, uh, write it with Janet. <laughs> 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 write it with Don. <laughs> Do you know? Uh, the U.S. Postal Service actually has National Stamp, Col Stamp Collecting Month, which is the month of October, and they usually have some special stamps that come out and a promotion around that. Um, it's kind of faded off. They don't do it as much now as they did maybe 15 years ago or 10 years ago, but we have National Stamp Collecting Month in this country, and so hold October aside for that. And we celebrate it here at the Postal Museum. Um, any other thoughts about what you heard you have the national parks as one issue, but the Colombians and the 1869s and the Transmiss are as individuals. How did you come up uh, with the national parks put in as a single uh, one to vote on? Do you remember? Uh, I, I know we do show the whole set, but do we, I think we, uh, I'd have to uh, refresh myself, I'm sorry. That I, I know that we weren't consistent on some things and we just went for, uh, 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 used artistic license to do what we thought would be, uh, uh, make a great book. I think that's right. Yeah. Anything else? Uh, can you tell them how many stamps were the original survey that was narrowed down to 100? I believe it was 65 or something. Was that, it was between 150 and 200. And it took quite a while, to, you can imagine, to not only select the 100, but then to rank order. And, and once you get 
beyond your, your favorite 20. It's, you know, <laughs> what's 21, 22, 89, something like that. Did the Farleys come in anywhere? I don't remember the Farleys. And we had the, the National Farleys. Parks, the perf set, but, but no, they did not, I believe. Yes? Both the one cent Z girl and the inverted Jenny are in the book, and uh, when you made that great trade, uh, that was, I think, a real thrill. Uh, I think it was a big uh, uh, event for the hobby. I, I just wondered if, if you might say a few words about the origin of that trade. Did, did Mr. Gross approach you, or did you approach him, or um, did, how, did, how did something like that come about? Can you repeat the question? I don't think everybody heard. Sure. Uh, it was the question about when we traded the uh, one cent Z grill for the uh, Jenny plate block. The, um, it's uh, obviously a long story, but uh, I purchased the stamp and then I put it for sale and asked a, a, a lot of money, two and a half million dollars. And I did that in part because I thought it was, I would have paid a million and a half dollars for it at the time. So I felt it was worth more than that since I'm a dealer. And so I was going to put it for sale for $2 million. And then I liked the gee whiz factor in stamps. I figured it was very unlikely to sell right away. And I thought, well, $2.5 million is a lot better than $2 million in terms of gee whiz. You go home and you tell somebody who's not a collector, I just saw a stamp that's worth $2.5 million. So then eight years went by, and the market had changed a lot. And I thought I'd fallen in love with the stamp. I thought, I really want to keep it. I don't want to sell it. So I pulled it off the market. And uh, at, every year or so, uh, uh, Charles Shreve, who uh, represents uh, Bill Gross, would call me up and say, are you interested in selling the stamp? And so I said, no, I'm not selling it. And as uh, the, another year went by or whatever, uh, I told Charles, the reason why I didn't want to sell it is that uh, I would have to buy something. And then I, I felt I would lose because I would pay taxes, I'd have less money. What else would be, in my mind, as good as the one cent Z-Girl? I couldn't think of anything. So then, actually, when the uh, Jenny Plate Boy came up for sale, uh, Charles and uh, Bill Gross uh, discussed it, and they pitched the idea to me. And they said, uh, what if we buy it and uh, trade it for the one cent Z-Girl? And I thought, oh, there's 100 Jennies. There's one one cent Z-Girl. I don't know. And so I kind of vacillated back and forth. But the more I thought about it, the more I warmed up to it. And so then we were discussing before the sale what to do and so Charles said I'll buy it and I'll say that it's for you because we're trading and I said no no let's break it into two stories because the sale of the Jenny plate block will probably get press and then a couple of weeks later we'll do a trade and then that'll be a whole nother story and we thought that's exciting for the hobby uh, Bill Gross is a great supporter of the hobby and Charles Shreve is uh, excellent too at this and so uh, that's what we did. We ended up having a little ceremony at Charles' office in New York, and Alan Kane came up and other people. And uh, it just generated a lot of positive buzz for the hobby. But it really was their idea. At first I was reluctant, and then I warmed up to it, and I'm certainly happy how it turned out. Thank you. Well, I'm sure you probably all have other little questions in your head, um, but um, both uh, Don and Janet will be... Um, available to answer them um, during the book signing today, which will happen outside in the Benjamin Franklin Forum. But let's give them another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Good job. Good job. Um, before I do let you go, I have a few more uh, announcements to make, and I'll keep it brief. What should we do? Um, but yeah. I do want to. Oh. You want to like me? Um. I want to make sure that everybody knows that um, some of the highlights of these top 100 are actually on display in our galleries today. So while you're um, getting your book signed, make sure you stop into um, both Rarity Revealed and our stamp pull-out frames room to see. Um, we've got Cattle in the Storm there, of course, the Inverted Jenny on display, um, Zeppelin's on display. So you know, make sure you stop by there. Um, and I did want to make sure everybody knew here that the National Postal Museum Research Library now has Saturday hours. They're open the third Saturday of every month. Um, so if you have an opportunity or a need to use that library and you're busy during the week, um, I hope you mark your calendars for those days so you can come down and use that library. Um, the books are available for sale 
in the museum shop. Um, if you are a member, you get a discount, and if you sign up for your membership today, that discount applies today. Um, if they do sell out of books, um, we also have wonderful commemorative sheets for you to get signed today, to put in your book that you buy later. So, or if you weren't planning to buy a book and would like um, signatures on, on the sheet with the date on it, you're welcome to pick one of those up from the table. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you very much.